Patrick O'Reilly, digital anthropologist at the Dock in Dublin, part of Accenture. My dear colleague, welcome. Thank you. What, what a lovely second welcome. Absolutely. We were just about to get started, and so we were like, yo, let's click record, let's save some of this juice for the viewers. Uh, you were about to describe what you do and what gets you going as a, a digital anthropologist. So what's that? What fun do you get to have that other people just are able to dream about? Well, um, what fun do I get to have? Like, I, I get I get to, I suppose, is it a little bit of smoke and mirrors in a way? Because digital anthropology, no surprise, is kind of like a moot thing. Like, if you're going to study humans, everything is now in some way digital. Um, it doesn't even need to be high tech to be digital. Digital um, can mean many things. It comes from the material school of anthropology. Um, the guy that's right. up, he's a archeologist from back in the day, uh, Daniel Miller. He, but then he got into, yeah, material studies, shopping habits, stuff, blue jeans, um, and began applying some of those, those thoughts to digital technologies. Like after all, this is made up of, um, this is my work laptop. So at what aluminium, those are max, right? Uh, glass, mm. zinc, lithium. These are made of materials, um, which I think the fundamental point would be are no different to a spade, a cup. I remember one of the first weeks in my course was we were carving wooden spoons um, because we're still anthropologists at the end of the day. Uh, and it was basically taking that approach to leveling the material world, not giving technology, digital technologies, any sort of special exceptionalism. And I was certainly arguing against certain, I guess, transhuman kind of high tech ideas that somehow technology has changed us. What we would say rather it's enabled a certain set of behaviors. Like um, if you think, Twitter made us more gossipy or cancelly or whatever. It's more that we were always that. We always had the capacity to do this thing. Uh, and we probably were already doing those things, but now we're doing it differently, uh, that it enables behaviours, but ultimately doesn't determine them. So that would be like the general approach for them. My interest when I kind of came to that um, was through social anthropology, and, you know, very interesting, like your standard fare with anthropology, what are people doing in different places in the world? What's that man in the jungle doing? What's that man in the, you know, polar ice caps doing? Um, but when it came time to write a dissertation to find something that I was particularly interested in, um, I, I, just, I just got stuck on 4chan. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so I, rel I relate. Yeah, like and that whole side of, of stuff because I'd been like active on that particular, or like well, active but lurking on that website for um, a long time, like the infamous arsehole of the internet. Um, and what I saw there was this whole archipelago of undiscovered tribes and weird, strange people. Oh. I think I cut out for a second there. But yeah, so saw lots of weird things going on in that particular space. Mm. Um, a, lots and lots of strange people, strange occurrences. And I started to hear some people in the course, some of the tutors and things begin talking. Gabriella Coleman had written her book about Anonymous, um, you know, exposing right. the hacktivists. And that was one of those popular anthropology books which we rarely see. It got into like, you know, Waterstones and stuff in the mm -hmm. UK um, and a lot of people read it but I remember seeing that and feeling really dissatisfied with how she treated the sort of source culture right this was like me I, I like this is definitely like a bit arrogant or elevate myself but there's a common thing in anthropology where certain in periods of anthropology where um, the people that were studied ended up seeing how they were studied seeing the results of like research, seeing some of the books published about them and going, well, that's not, that's not us. That's not, that doesn't yeah. describe us. 
And I yeah. felt somewhat a digital native and associated, you know, understood the culture of 4chan. And I saw the way she was writing about it and it didn't sit right with me. So I wanted to study that myself. As a digital native, as a lurker of 4chan, as a savvy anthropologist, and as a creative, what were the things that, that what are the things that are left unsaid in such analysis? What are the things that are missed? What are the important aspects that are pervasive in the deep human DNA that Gabriella Coleman and mainstream anthropology and mainstream opinion miss, you think? Well, um, I mean, for one, I heard many people um, dismissing right off the bat, and this came from the course program director, the, you know, all these people that were really meant to know about these things. This is the digital anthropology, such a small discipline, it's growing, cyber anthropology, I think they do in Denmark, and but still very, very early days in this kind of burgeoning field. And these were the people that were meant to know about these things. Um, and I heard time and time again, 4chan in particular being dismissed through its sort of pop culture uh, reputation, which as anthropologists is, you know, that's anathema, surely. Um, and surely you can't just assume that you've read some stuff about 4chan in the news and therefore can quite tidily package it. How could you say something about it so sweeping if you've never been there, especially as an anthropologist? That's your whole <laughs> thing. So I heard people dismissing it and going like, oh yeah, it's just a, it's trolls. And this was also way <laughs> past, you know, troll as a term had been dropped for, you know, it, kind of boomer speak and, and all this sort of stuff. And it was dismissed really readily. And, and I'm sitting there going like, fuck man, like they, um, one thing that always stays, you know, there's, there's a cooking board. There's an origami board. Um, I remember when the uh, out slash out slash um, the outdoors board was brought mm. into 4chan, which obviously seems a bit like, oh, you know, these people, we're all meant to be shut-ins. Like, who's, who the fuck's going outside, right? Like, what's that about? And I clicked on it, and I saw the first post, and it was a picture of maybe hundreds of pairs of hiking gloves. And the caption was, why can't I stop buying hiking gloves? And I was like, uh, never change <laughs> yes how 4chan goes outside um yeah so that was it like i saw it being misunderstood i saw people not really integrating themselves into the, the actual culture not really kind of understanding what that was whatever you felt that was you know and there's lots of terrible things about 4chan culture but they they just they took one side of it they didn't really you know they, they weren't being anthropologists absolutely that's brilliant uh, let's go deeper into 4chan. One of the things that you mentioned that st stuck out for me was how, uh, and, and if I may summarize or paraphrase, humans are the constant technology as a variable. They just the technology doesn't really invent new behaviors in us. It just kind of selects and amplifies a certain amount of them that are somehow and built into us through our evolutionary makeup. When I go to 4chan, one of my favorite boards is slash X slash. I love the paranormal board because it's the most schizophrenic board. And by that, I think it kind of taps into this more shamanic temperament, into this more divinatory praxis that I feel is important. Now, some of the things that they do there um, range from using the actual number posting as, uh, as a divinatory method, not dissimilar to throwing dice or the Ouija boards, or even like going into the Bible and doing the whole Kabbalistic thing of switching the Hebrew letters of the Bible, switching them for numbers or switching them for, for other letters and like figuring out weird numbers and via those numbers, different meanings, right? Divination, scrying, uh, synchronicity, right? And I'm interested in, 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 you know, Owen's been reading a lot of Crowley and Dion Fortune and the Kabbalah. And I find it interesting that it comes uh, down to folks like us, this, this, you know, this, this shitty makeup of, of weirdos on the internet to come up with the new royal science or to garb the new royal science again in new robes. Obviously, this is the internet and this is 4chan and this is all in many 
the way is it has like an outer layer that seems very disrespectable, especially for the bougie guardian reading crowd, right? Bourgeois people look forward to it. Oh my God, how, how cringe, how disrespectful. But, but, but beneath that, there's something interesting. The, the internet as a repository of human flows and libido makes for these new ways of divination. People believe Pepe the Frog is an ancient Egyptian deity. People throw the dice to try to see what the, their number is. What does that tell us about the collective mind, especially when it anonymizes, when it becomes unconscious? What weird, edgy things do we find there? Does anything come up? Yeah, I think um, it's, I mean, I've seen it be at the forefront of many of these sorts of, well, this is a thing, you know, are they, are they instincts? Are they drives towards this? these peculiarities because x is just one example of many of those sorts of things um and you've seen whether it's x or whether it's on the politics board or lgbtq board um that or even uh the s4s board which is i guess like a humor type board that you find a lot of novel ways of I don't know, it, it, it could even be memes, um, but or another ways of talking about things, another ways of um, of doing, which I then start to see replicated over time in other spaces on the internet. Like um, maybe they're like trailblazers and 4chan has always had a, a, a reputation for that, um, being at the forefront of these sorts of social phenomena. And whilst I can't speak to maybe where that's found itself in popular culture, um, you can certainly see elements of that Kabbalistic turn or desire in other internet spaces. Um, I would point towards X as being like the originary of of many of that sort of thing. Um, And so you start to ask questions like, well, why why 4chan? What about 4chan um, produces those? sorts of things is it something to do with the anonymous nature of it um is it the demographics of 4chan what exactly is the technology enabling in us um or maybe who exactly is gathering there and Mm. that kind of thing i suppose i I don't you just need to investigate you would need to to follow that up like i mean i wonder whether there's elements of 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 faith or reenchantment or because that's what I would see. That's what I kind of saw on on X was this uh, uh, yeah a desire for reenchantment um, of the world. And right, right. I mean, does it come from there? And where has it gone? I I don't know. You'd pro- you'd have to kind of follow those digital ley lines. Um, and speculate that's, on that. But it puts me in the idea in the. It gives me thinking about this notion of psychogeography that for God knows how long there's always been a kind of sense amongst different people that particular paces, places um, invoke or enable certain latent potentials in the body or in the psyche. Very often these might be things that have been identified as being sacred sites. Like in, uh, in the UK, we have Glastonbury, for example, Glastonbury tour. And if you, If you go there and you go there with the right state of mind, it is a very, very strange and intense place. I think it's no surprise that one of the biggest music festivals in the world, one of the kind of bastions of 20th century pop culture, ended up being on the site of this hundreds year old um, kind of occult site. But the interesting thing about digital architecture is that we can begin to kind of recognize that a space doesn't have to be a physical space. It's simply a place that is a coming together of certain latent potentials. And so somewhere like 4chan has become that for whatever reason, there, there was a kind of need for that outlet for some kind of, uh, for, for the otherness to express itself. And it does there. And, and there are other places like it too. There, there's other, internet forums and message boards that allow for different latent potentials to speak the whole fucking web of of porn 
is a kind of way of expressing the repressed and the unspoken complexes around femininity and the sexual revolution, for example. Um, and the, the particular taxonomy of 4chan, precisely because it does have that, um, that anonymity, and I think also the, the extremeness, there's always been a sense of, I think, any, I'm, and I'm not a 4chan guy, so I kind of speak as a bit of an outsider, but my impression is, especially on the more radical extreme boards, is precisely a place where anything goes. A place where anything goes when it comes to um, schizophrenic ramblings or political ideas that are beyond the uh, the spectrum of the acceptable, and uh, and I see both of your eyes lighting up, so I'm just going to stop there and let one of you run with it. I I I I'm going to steal that because I um, I mean this this is this is really interesting because I know and I, I know that you guys are into all of this like the the I mean. Dan, I think like when I first met you, you said you were you were a monk. Something Priest, like maybe. Priest. <clears throat> yeah. Because monks um, are aesthetic and I'm the opposite. Yeah, monk, yeah, yeah. Uh <laughs> like I okay, so because ley line psychogeography, these sorts of things, and whether they can happen online, like that's super interesting. Um, I think that if we're gonna talk. Something that comes to my mind, um, especially when we're talking about X and 4chan. Now, X, I think, was less, I don't know, you, you can f say this, you can fill me in on this, Daniel, but I think X was less about, I'm, I'm talking conspiracy theories, I'm thinking of conspiracy theories. Um, and X, I think, probably had a, a heavy involvement in that. Um, the politics board very, very heavily into, into conspiracy theories. Um, now, there's this great book by a, uh, uh, she's an anarchist anthropologist called um, Erica Leglis, I think. And she wrote a book called The Occult Features of Anarchism on the conspiracy of kings and the da -da -da -da. like, it's got this very like, um, very long treatsy like occult kind of name. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's awesome. And it traces um, the involvement of magical and occult thinking in the development of early science. Um, and it essentially makes a defense as well of conspiracies and conspiracy thinking. Um, there's background of it, which is sort of like the first half of the book. If it's a short book, definitely recommend it. Goes into, and you know, if you're, talk, if you're talking Crawley and things like that, it's like looking at all of the, uh, the, 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 the spark of the enlightenment coming through, you know, the Arab world and the mysticism that was involved in mathematics and the idea that one could, you know, holy mathematics, that you could find God by geometry and all this sort of stuff. Um, and how that was just, you know, all of the early scientists were at golden dawn and were, you know, you know, the story of the, the you know, occult scientists. Um, those two were, were, were heavily intertwined. Um, but then also, and so pulls, continues to pull on that thread of thought and say it is, uh, continuing today, it's as relevant today, these sorts of occultist, conspiratorial thoughts around who's pulling the strings and all that sort of thing, um, and kind of makes an argument going like, if you don't like conspiracy theories, you're a classist. Um, and that rather, you know, conspiracy theories can be, and typically are terribly racist and awful, um, especially all the Zionistic, all that. It's, 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 it's awful, but it's essentially what it's, 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 folk myths now we're coming back to paul we're coming back to x and we're seeing people constructing conspiracy theories or modern myths of the world in order to conceptualize what's going on in order to tell a story about it and if we're thinking myths storytelling we're also thinking now you know utopianism and the power of that which politically is very important and often encouraged especially in leftist circles for utopian mythic thinking for constructing narratives of a world that we actually want to live in or again constructing folk narratives around why we are in this situation big scary cabal of evil lizard people that are controlling the world system it's not really far off can our political project not be to sanitize that of things we don't like the racist terrible awful uh, things. I mean, I'm saying as a leftist, um, can we not 
invest in conspiratorial thinking, invest in these myths and tell them how we might want them to be told uh, and potentially move that on to utopian blah, 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 political project. Uh, and is not somewhere like X doing that? Is somewhere like Paul not doing that? And the fact that we will look away from it because it's ugly and strange and racist, uh, we've sort of abdicated that, that ground. Here's an angle that I feel my dad's heard of. We spoke about the genius Lochi, right? Or rather when Owen was speaking about 4chan uh, as a place, as a space in the metaverse to be, i.e. internet 2.0. Like it's a website, doesn't really exist. Yet the material conditions, and you're like a digital anthropologist, the material conditions of the interface of this website as interface frame the way that the narrative complexes emerge therein. In other words, there's a few affordances to 4chan that other websites do not have that might attest or justify its influence, uh, the anonymous nature of posting, the fact that posts uh, disappear if they do not get enough hits after a little bit. These are very subtle, but I would argue very important affordances, right? Because they frame how the narratives within that website, within this forum, which is all it's, it's, it is, it's just people posting text and images. How many of those do we have around the internet? My God, we have so many. But yet 4chan has attained tremendous influence. But perhaps these subtleties of, 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 of materiality, of the influence, facilitate, because they are so subtle, maybe, maybe it's not like people have been oversteering, maybe understeering is the right way to, to design such the, emerg the emergence of such genius loci, the egregores of 4chan and, and these collective things. Now, what emerges in the internet? Sex. Porn web, as Owen was saying, right? Porn web is 50% of the internet is porn. And the shape of that portion of the internet is the shape of shame, is the shape of what you do not show on daily life. Um, these are the online ley lines. In other words, if the ley lines emerge on the internet, if there are flows, if there are, if there is a cadence to the way that online desire flows, and if that cadence ends up uh, plowing the riverbeds that end up making the shape of the internet, politics, and culture, then that is the shape of shame or guilt or other dirty things. And they all lead to the asshole, so to speak. They all lead back to the bot in men and women, maybe to other things like the cervix or blah. They lead to the body and sex in, in a way. And that's a very interesting point that I wanted to like, that, that came up when you guys were speaking, right? Because the emergence, you know, Patrick, you were speaking about the conspiracies and these conspiracies are the way that some, there are the narrative complexes, narratively designed complexes through which some people make sense of the world, especially the creatives, the outliers, the marginals who are precisely the ones who will be able to produce a revolution, an insurrection, an anarchy, coup, which um, I'm going to be on that side uh, forever because I'm just so excited about that possibility. Uh, and it seems to me like the shape of that coup, the shape of revolution is the shape of anti-shame or anti-guilt, not necessarily a sexual revolution 60s style, but rather thinking about how these interfaces, these words, these mots de jouissance, emerge through like psychoanalytically really emerge time and again on 4chan this ultimate place this asshole of the internet the place with no shame because it has no name uh, how it emerges there and how it produces political movements is remarkable in the last 10 years or 20 years how many powerful means have come out of 4chan how many political movements have had their root there how many crimes horrible heinous things have also been documented there right school shooters posting there i'm going to shoot the school and then doing it they post it on on the internet in the same way that shame is stored in certain parts of the body so my point here and my sort of question is 
it's fortune is indeed a barometer, right? It's a barometer of where the social psyche is at and a barometer of where the complexes of sex are in the body. And also of the material conditions of both the digital world, the economic world, but also the physical world. Have you ever gone to HC or GIF or the sexy woman? You will find invariably the same threads time and again. Those are the most regular boards for the most uh, invariably, the most invariable bo boards of fortune. They always show the same things. They show the same fantasies taking place. And and again, if the, if the fortune is the asshole, then that's the asshole of the asshole. And it feels like those. Like if you want a real room, trip, like you got to go to D. D. What's D? <laughs> So, uh, you know, if you're talking about no shame, you know, D is, uh, I think it's like deviant board, which is like where all of the most extreme fetishes live. This is like, uh, uh, oh, I really like women who dissolve into jelly, but then that jelly reforms into the shape of an inflatable dolphin, which I might roll over with a steamroller to make flat. Insect stuff, gore, gore. All of like the weirdest possible things and honestly guys like that's if you want to feel normal and if you also just want to night just see a load of people being really nice to each other you know inquiring about each other's well i mean i really like snails but i could ants like it's just really why what happened to you what happened in your childhood it's a extreme example of but it's it's genuine anarchy right it's it's whatever the the human libido crossed with the images and symbols that we have is able to come up with and, and, I think and so as, as a result i think anything as i said that cannot be spoken within the acceptable parameters of mainstream left right taken as one thing will be vomited onto the table somewhere and someone will be and, there to lap it up. And that's why I think I think these spaces like 4chan, like Pornweb, are essential for culture. Culture is always born in the gutter because the ruling class are always conservative. They just want to keep things how they are. Exactly. And, and in addition to that, uh, just very quickly, it seems to me like the step zero of authority, the step zero of authorship, as well as of insurrection, is at the point of libido. Before World War II, there was loads of mm, content being produced and, and, and initiatives that actually reflect a lot of what we see today. In Weimar Germany, in Hungary, we were talking about giving sex ed to like literally six-year-olds. Um, there was, Wilhelm Reich was having a field day touting the benefits of pure unleashing this 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 unleashing to which uh conservatives are so uh repulsed by it is an anarchy it is an un unleashing of flows and now in the age of the internet we see perhaps perhaps something similar under the bane of capitalism and certain slightly different material conditions the genius loci of the internet and of capitalism is the same as it was 1920 and 30 in Weimar, Europe, and Germany, etc. Yeah, and, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll just to just finish off like point zero of authority, point zero of foundation and creation uh, has to has to contend with sex because political movements are libidinal enjoyment movements. Yeah. I think um, even to credentialize 4chan in the, in, in the respect of like the studies that have shown huge impact on the 2016 election and Trump, um, obviously memes going an extremely long way towards that. Also obviously QAnon comes from, from, from it essentially comes from 4chan um, or the chans um, just because, you know, people might not, know that like a lot of a lot of things have come out of this particular space obviously the anonymous movement which is credited with like 
enabling Arab Spring. It's, it's all, you know, how much can you prove this? But I've seen some very good and thorough research, especially on the 2016 uh, election, which looks at sort of 4chan as the kind of the, the rock polisher for I. For, for diamonds that find their way into, into Twitter space and into other, other places. Like kind of the asshole, this generative like place where everything falls, sinks, rises back out of again. Um, but I think on your point there about uh, margins, these other places um, sort of coming, margins coming to define the center um, and things like that. Um, yeah, I think you're seeing and I think we always have seen this, this, it is incredibly generative. And I think um, maybe even going back and thinking about ley lines again, um, about the influence, because a ley line is not simply like a, like a network theory, right? It's not like, um, cause that there's this idea that, that we're now, you know, we're in a network society that if you could plot out all of these different lines and connections between nodes that we could, Sort of understand better or map in some way. There's this, you know, this desire to map influence and and uh, who influences what, when, how. Um, I think like a ley line. Um, it's it's connected by nodes, right? It intersects things, but it's it's. I think it's far more it's less a connection and far more of like a, an idea of of movement. Um, that it is, it, it pushes in a particular way, um, not a connection, but a but a movement, a movement to and between places. And I think there's certainly something, something there, like using that concept to talk about or think about networks, um, to not over focus on the node. This is typically how we think about social life, organizations, people, even as a as a kind of a blob in space. Tim Ingold, um, who is a material anthropologist um, up in Aberdeen. He did his his work in in Lapland. His his ethnography. That's his sort of like chops as an anthropologist. Um, studies craft and doing and creating. But he talks about. He wrote some amazing pieces about lines. Uh, the life of lines, and I think conceiving mm. of social life. Conceiving of of people more as lines rather than blobs mm. is a useful way to think about this that we extrapolate the ley line thing that people rather are movements and energies um, towards certain things um, and what would it look like to consider these ley lines to consider or to even to somehow make visible the lines between um the margins in the center political movements to as you're talking about porn web to map the drives towards these things this is not a connection between an individual and an individual or a network and another network or a website and another website but rather streams these things that happen to push people in particular directions um what would we see and how could we even do that that's as untethered as I'm going to try and let my thought get. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. So yeah, quickly, another point that comes up here is that these lines that you speak of, right? Here's three points about those lines. One, they are rhizomatic. They do not share the linear structure or how we usually conceive of a structure of a network is, is you have a lot of lines intersecting, but they are more like a rhizome where any point can be a center. It's not like the internet has a center, like a castle in the middle of the city and the city expands outwards in like concentric circles. Rather in the internet, you see like every post being a potential center for a new political movement, right? Will it get double digits, triple digits, quadruple digits or not? That's kind of the illustration. Uh, for the rhizomatic nature, the decentralized nature. And that just that just that different topology itself throws us into disarray, throws our world, our world where we evolved to be like bipeds who pick berries and hunt. It throws that world into disarray. And it kind of makes us 
go a little bit into the shamanic dream world, the nether world, a little bit. That's one. Number two is like, it's dialectic. And that's the tricky one, right? Because when I mentioned that sometimes you go into these boards of 4chan that, that this, or porn web, what you see there is the shape of shame that people don't admit to. It is dialectical in that it is the desire itself, right? Is excess, is the excess that the personality, that the ego cannot hold and therefore relates to as the place of resigns of excess disruption. It is disruption proper. And when you see that in places like Fortune, when you see these posts saying the ugly words, showing the ugly images, or maybe even enjoying the ugly words and the ugly images, it seems to me like that represents a sort of dialectical place where an attempt to almost perform the left-hand path of magic, the path to is via excess. Let us not suppress our fantasy. Let us indulge in them to the point that they become something else. I've seen hypno threads on 4chan where people mm, get their rocks off simply based on the fact that they want to uh, very hard, they want to embody this fantasy, embody this this new identity that is so anathema to their ego. So it is the it is the purposeful chasing of that dissolution of the ego and its coagulation into something else. And then finally, it's it's excessive. It's the fortune as the asshole of the internet is precisely the site of the excess of the internet of the ego, of the personality of of the world. That's why you go there and you hear and you see things that are so ugly, so disgusting. You see school shooters announcing that they're going to kill thousands of people and then they do it. And you see um, the most ugly, sexist, racist, uh, homophobic kinds of things. But then on the other board, you see people precisely enjoying that. And so that is the side of excess. And as excess, as a thing that makes the dialectic flip and the identity flip and reevaluate itself. Which identity? Well, all of them, it's rhizomatic. And that's where I think 4chan represents this unique scrying board, this tool of a satanic conspiracy or even Promethean conspiracy to evolve the collective mind in the age of the internet. So it's an, it's an accelerator. Yeah, and, and maybe it um, is that, maybe it represents that, maybe it represents spaces like this because, you know, it, it certainly is, directionless and in almost um and intentionally so um old example when the anonymous movement came up you know the board supported it or the, the website supported it hugely big effects big ddos attacks and all mm -hmm. the sort of like amazing political action but then people started to take it too serious right it stopped being a joke and these people started to moralize based on it this was all around the um tom cruise scientology was what initially instigated the debate was him trying to the church of scientology trying to wipe a weird video of him off the internet and they just objected to this idea of like being able to delete or control the internet um 4chan standing for that sort of pure chaotic drive to everything always all at once um, but people became too serious and became too political with it. And they became ostracized, uh, ignored, laughed at, put in their place. And this has happened with every significant movement as well as every significant meme on 4chan. Does it, it lives, then it dies and it moves on. And this is constant churning and, and, and journey. Um, and there's a certain madness here. This is like something that I focused on a lot in the, the mad chaotic nature or I was even trying to yeah in a in a mad moment myself trying to propose anonymous this figure the character of anonymous built through 4chan this person that stands for everything and nothing really it's just white males between the age of 22 and 36 um, but try I was trying to propose this new figure as a new you know an avatar uh, to, to join the pantheon of uh, alongside Loki, the trickster, or you know whatever else, um, that this it felt to me that it was so it was such a new. This is as close as we've ever come, historically, socially, culturally, towards anonymity in in its truer 
sense, you know, anonymity, you know, and we're anonymous. And with each passing minute, we become less and less anonymous to one another. We, we see each other, we can recognize one another, we speak, we engage in a relationship, and it very quickly recedes as anonymity. But maintaining that, what huge social cultural effects does that have? Well, we can see what effects that has. So I, I really like this idea of this pantheonic figure um, of, the, of, of anonymous. And one quote, which was always associated, often like depict uh, in a suit, again, because assumed genders and all the like, it was a suited person without a head or maybe with a question mark. It's kind of anonymous type figure. We're often using the Guy Fawkes mask to represent anonymity. Um, but there was always this quote that was associated with it, which is, um, and it, I think it's, it's along the lines of like, you know, the internet is serious business. It's like all that like really old internet speech or um, yeah, this idea of serious business that for the lulls, that old term now, um, that doing something just because it was funny, just because chaos, just, you know, this Loki esque like I just did it because fuck it. They were really exhibiting that kind of energy and it was always a serious business. And there's this, um, I think it's nostalgia um, in Tarkovsky's film. There's this whole figure, another fool figure. This is, I started to become really interested in the fool because Anon, you know, Anon, that figure was a little bit trickster, a little bit fool. And the fool always plays this, you know, the, the reversal um, of all things, the upending, the carnivalesque, right? The reversal of the king and the pauper on May Day, um, something that has been, you know, in all societies for a very long time, these reversal of roles, the role of the fool. And in this particular movie, they have um, the, a holy fool, which is a kind of a Russian archetype, and the, the movie ends with this, um, this madman who's been kind of coaching the, um, the protagonist through his mad view on the world. You know, the protagonist has sort of been following this guy through this, 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 this story and seeing the way that he sees the world and, you know, as, as we are, but never quite understanding it. And the end of the film, he stands um, uh, on a statue, on a scaffolding on a statue, plays Ode to Joy, uh, and self-immolates himself under this banner, um, which I think translates, is in Latin, but I think translates to, we're not mad, we're serious. And I think those two things kind of come together in a really nice way, because this, you know, this mad man was, as most Russian holy fools are, are seeing some deeper truth of the universe, of the world, which is why they're holy, they're Christ-like. They bring a truth to this, you know, through their madness in this, in this um, is it picaresque way, in this Don Quixote kind of fashion but they actually speak some kind of truth through madness the opposite of life is not death the opposite of life is madness and through this insanity they yeah they speak something to power to the structure in this instance it was post-soviet russia and going this is terrible this is awful <laughs> this doesn't work um, and i think something about 4chan is doing similar um that it poses as that kind of avatar as that intentional contradiction people didn't like trump 4chan liked trump people liked trump 4chan got over trump <laughs> absolutely it's it's a trick to space it, it's it's i'd even like following the thinking of our friend who Daniel mentioned, Alexander Bard, who's got this idea he calls syntheism, which is basically the, the idea that with the internet, we are actually building God for real. <coughs> and right. so you can think of the deities as, as names for particular characteristics that come out of, uh, of, of people, but especially particular ways of relating between people. So in certain spaces, I will play the trickster. In certain spaces, I will play the, uh, I guess, the, the piper and so on and so forth. Daniel also, big, big trickster relationally. And clearly, as far as I can see, what's happening in a space like 4chan is that enough relationality along this lines of trickster is happening so that it's actually turning into a temple to the trickster god. And that's precisely the way to think about it. Similarly, you could say porn web, I think, 
is turning into a temple for the kind of uh, the divine whore, which has its like destructive aspects and say the like vampiric creature, um, but then also perhaps more affirmative in say something like Venus or Aphrodite. And then you've got characters like uh, divine whore as a website, good point. Uh, characters like Lilith, who uh, depending on which side of Christian and Jewish mythology you're standing is kind of seen as a force for liberation for femininity or like the thing about women that has to be repressed. She's not part of orthodox dogma at all. We can't even speak that name because it's even, and that, that is what returns in the, in the obscenity of porn web. Um, and so this goes back to our kind of ley line psychogeography thinking. What is being born in the internet is a pantheon, but a pantheon of temples to the various deities. And as we move into more, uh, more sophisticated metaverse architecture, I think it's reasonable to suppose that people will actually start to build spaces to reflect this. So 4chan won't just be a message board. 4chan will be an aesthetic that you can go inside and be there. Fortune is a style of enjoyment, I feel. I can manifest in a space with all of its affordances and special qualities. Right now, it manifests as a website with its own genius, but it's the genius as a space, it feels to me, as the, the quality and the affordances of that space. So uh, let's put the question on, on the reverse. <clears throat> what are the things, interface-wise, design-wise, that that Loki will need to manifest himself. And those are very concrete. Anonymity, an environment of one-upping each other. Uh, the same reason why it's men on 4chan is the same reason why it's been historically mostly men, I guess, doing comedy or doing trickster type stuff. It's because there's a connection to their own evolutionary libidinal chances right uh, man's got to become something and even if that's a trickster if that gets me a little bit of pussy then my god then, then men will do it and we'll go to war for that so my point is the affordances of of the trickster god in order to become space manifest themselves in places like fortune and will manifest themselves in the metaverse as well so should we push it in that direction into a bit of speculative fabulation on um, metaverse things. Fabulous. Because I get kind of, sometimes I get strung out when, when, when things are too, um, where I don't return to uh, material for a moment or return to a, an, an example, uh, you know, a, a, people in this place do this. Like, as an anthropologist, I get, yeah, antsy um, when things get too far flung and um, too in the air. I just want to say one thing, which I was reflecting on after listening to you guys talk to Alexander Dugan. Um, and it just got me thinking again about this sort of re-enchantment of secular society um you're there own talking about you know spaces or, or you know temples being built i i think we're we're maybe all convinced in some way that there is a sort of spiritual religious aspect to a lot of this maybe we're just hungering for it because we're also dugans um in in people who grew up in a secular society and have you know have this sort of phantom limb syndrome I don't, I don't think we're ever secular okay i mean i would agree i, I think i think it the we have always built temples to particular deities it, it's just often it's being done unconsciously so 20th century society the story it tells about itself is we are secular while it continues to send people off to football stadiums to worship the god of war and to nightclubs to worship the gods of sex and so on and so forth. So uh, th this kind of, um, this thinking around re-enchantment, whether it's uh, even, even from the kind of traditionalist angle that we need to re-enchant, I think is wrong. I'm trying to be from a just position of pure descriptiveness. I think this is simply what's happening. 
because we interact with the world via symbols. And symbols speak through us and speak more than we intend to say through us. As yeah. channels for libido, which is mostly coming unconsciously. So I would agree, but then what, what, what then is missing for me is a uh, belief, faith. This seems to me to be something that one can't fake. This is the, the thing that has been taken from me personally, in a sense. And listening to Dugan talk about it, like it, it seemed to me that there was this this desire to because faith you know that 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 idea surely is something separate from uh religious practices i suppose zizek would say that practice is religion you know his comment on pascal's wager being that you are more religious than somebody who has faith and believes if as long as you're practicing and doing the religion even if you're faking it that is um religion and practice um, and yet I can't help but feel that there is some sort of some sort of gap or something missing if I don't have this thing that I would call faith or belief that no matter what my practice is, I don't ever really believe myself. And I feel that hunger or that desire to find that, to recapture that, to discover it in some way. And I'm not convinced I ever will. I think I was saying to Daniel this morning, I think this is a a characteristically masculine striving to always be seeking for a depth beneath the surface. But I was Ooh. kind of speculating <laughs> that, I mean, so, so I was building this argument basically from a, from a line of Crowley where Crowley says that men and women are stars, but a male is a star that radiates from the center outwards. Whereas a woman or a female is a star that radiates from the circumference inwards. And this accounts for the difference between men and women. And this is why the occult doctrine is that women have no soul. What it means is that woman is the enjoyment of surface and appearance as surface, pulling in and promising some depth within it, but that is never found. And obviously, like a feminist might hear that and go, oh, that's really offensive that women don't have a soul. But I think it's actually quite affirmative. And if you just look at the way that women love beauty and getting dressed up and love cute presents and loves having their feelings validated without needing to be solved, that that's exactly how it works. Like men want to solve problems so we can go back to the depths behind things. I'm like, Daniel, I'm upset. OK, bro, how can we work through this? Why? So you can go back to being Owen. But my girlfriend doesn't want me to solve her problems because there's nothing to get back to. It is just appearance, quite appearance. So where I'm coming back to where I started with this is that I think the man relates to otherness as if it's a woman. And there's some kind of longing that beneath the appearances, the, the madness and the beauty and the lust of it all, we're going to find some divine creation, find some depth to, 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 what would you say, to mirror our own depth, our own longing for depth. But really, there's nothing behind it. You're all obelisks and, and dolmens. Um, that's so. I mean, I, 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 as an anthropologist, um, or in a lot of the, the stuff that I've read, and I find it hard to agree with that particular vision of um, man, woman. Um, I've seen many ways in which, or read many ways in which. Um, man and woman are conceived in you know in incredibly different ways and a lot of them also spiritual so I can see it as one way um, of conceiving of them of differences or even sort of the that particular binary and like there's something that is really attractive about a lot of that that and I think yeah you're right like like a woman could find their place in that particular doctrine and be quite comfortable um and even with a lot of like old, I'm just nodding a book, but like old Celtic beliefs and things, there's um, old witchcraft and, and folklore and stuff. There's, it's a very, it's quite a comfortable place to be. It's a very, um, we look back and, and judge harshly some of those particular measures of what is man, what is woman. Um, but I, yeah. I find that hard to, to to come to some sort of like totalizing assessment of 
what is one, what is the other, without going, what is what is the what is how has socialization affected this? Like, and how strong the ability, uh, or how strong the influence of culture and of society of nurture. For me, it makes it impossible almost to have any discussion about the effect of nature or the influence. Well, I, I think yeah. you could go back. I think I'm to, more. I, I, think no, I'm I more. got something to say here. I think you can Go really take it back to actually just very um, primitive uh, sexual differentiating roles in that the, the male member of the species is much more likely to have to go and fight and die in war. And so it develops a psychic strategy for, being, for desiring to go and die in war. I think at the core of this idea of Crowley's that I've just mentioned is that the man has a deep longing to die for something. And that is ultimately the thing at the core. And the ultimate kind of purpose of perhaps masculine spiritual practice is to discover what am I willing to die for? Whereas for the female member of the species who is less likely to be going off into war and fighting and dying, actually her orientation is much more into the giving birth of new life. There's a different way of relating to her innermost depth. In fact, her innermost depth is to create something else rather than to die for something. So that's how I kind of um, would explain that idea in secular uh, anthropological terms, you might say. Yeah, there's a lot of things that, that I mean, so some things that would contradict, some things that would support. One thing that comes to mind is um, during uh, one of the guys, one of the anthropologists in the radical anthropology group in London um, did this sort of study uh, and he calls it the hero, the hero gene, which he he says explains this desire for you know when when I don't know you know the wild animal is charging at the group, why one person stops and you know jumps into its mouth kind of thing, um, jumps into the jaws of the beast, um, and it does seem to be some sort of biological drive to do this, um, which speaks more towards a selfness selflessness, a collective, an understanding of the whole as. Um, you know, uh, a mutualism rather than an individualism, a collectivism of the, the human species. Um, so there are examples like this, but there's also, you know, even if this was the, you know, even as this is the the defining structural difference between, you know, and, and Levi Strauss, the again, I was saying I got into anthropology through geology. You know, Levi Strauss was originally a geologist, and he would follow. Speaking of lines, that's what you're doing in geology. You're trying to find the separation between two beds, and he's trying to follow this dike. Um, along as it goes underground up and down and it kind of like moves through the environment twists and turns geology is very like life in that in the field it never works how it should um, but a way that he was doing to trace where the dike was because there was this rock on this side and there was this rock on that side one was more acidic one was more alkali or produced more acidic soil so you could look at the plants on the surface you could look at surface things which would point towards deep underlying structures. So that was his project that creates, you know, it ends up in postmodernism. You know, it's it's like intellectual trajectory. But, and so, you know, this, if this is a deep underlying structure, if this is like the pee under the princess's mattress, which keeps her up at night. I, I mean, I don't, maybe I don't, maybe add a few more mattresses. Like I see, all of those mattresses as being able to mask that pee, those mattresses being uh, social cultural phenomena. Um, there are cultures where your gender was determined by the labor that you did rather than <clears throat> outward signifiers of, of inner sex. That there are, there are so many examples of different ways that human communities have conceived of gender, whether they're incorrect or not, or biologically accurate or not, it seems to me that the, the, the very existence of those proves that we can talk about underlying structure all we like, but it's never really going, it's just one more animating myth um, and a justification for a whole bunch of social and cultural reasons why we define man and how we define woman. Right. Just, I disagree, uh, that, that, that's just relative. There's two relativists, there's still a P underneath the mattress. Relativism. <laughs> let me let me try to, try, to, try to say, let me say something that I, I think conciliates. Um, what if there is no P as a structural element, right? 
but that there are just ways of laying down that tend to follow along gendered lines. Let's not get stuck on the structural debate about sexuality and gender, because that's almost like an essentialism that is just useless. But rather, we can totally say definitively that there is a way of male jouissance that manifests itself on 4chan, majority male, uh, happens to be male gender and male, male sex 90% of the time, like everything else, but you know, you gotta make a specific exception and that's no problem. The point here is that that typical way of male jouissance tends to have the following structure in doing appearance as appearance. Uh, it, 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 whereas you could say that a female mode of, of jouissance tends to have this characteristic of uh, surface uh, of, of seeking to polish the surface as surface. And I think that, oh, and that's what you were trying to speak to a while ago, right? Man is a depth without surface. That's why men get lost in video games and playing war, war games and get lost into these rabbit holes on the internet because they, they do not understand surface. So they go into porn lab and get and die there because all they see is the depth of their own libido coming forth. Whereas on the other side of the angle, you could make the argument, you know, that there is no woman there's just surface but that as surface there's a tremendous reality and then again to add on top of that the Zizekian idea right the, the gods don't exist they're just fictions but as fictions they are profoundly real and so who is it get, that gets lost on this mad crazy surface uh, this this motherly all allowing surface of fortune well it is men so fortune is a feminine space almost because it allows for everything. It's a surface that allows for everything. It's anonymous, et cetera. It has no name. It's pre-mirror stage. It's pure infantilization on, on, uh, on a certain sense. It's pure return to the womb regression. And who gets lost into this web? It is men precisely because of the nature of the difference between male's resource and female's resource. I, I would just Might add, this add to that slightly. I, I almost, I think you've almost got it. The bit you missed, but it is entirely there is that it's, 4chan is a space of insane surface longing for depth that's yeah. why it's conspiratorial we need to find the truth behind all of, we've got all the data we're just going to throw everything here and then we're going to find the truth behind it but if you detach from that and just view it as surface as surface that might give give rise to some very interesting creative fluctuations then you can enjoy it See it as like a punk rock concert or like a fucking bathroom stall in a pub. Yeah, and I think ultimately that is just so much more interesting. Like I uh, just thinking about back on just even just what I was the argument that I was about to engage in there, where it's like it's so dull and so boring to to me personally. There's a reason why I'm not a geologist um, and I'm not a Straussian. Is that it's I I kind of could care less really. Um, what a particular underlying reason is for this, that, and the other. Um, my, what I'm interested in is what is happening now in front of me? What can I observe? These people are doing this particular kind of thing. Let's figure out their reasons for doing this, why they're doing it, what are they actually doing? Um, to speculate about, you know, to go too deep, to, to, it's, it's an inconclusive, it's, it's, it's cyclical, it doesn't really matter. Um, what is far more interesting is looking at what's firing off that space, what weird things um, are shooting out, um, like um, <coughs> speaking of lines and, and, and strings and rhizomes, you know, there's this um, complex, weird network of strings that are being interlinked um, and they're being passed on new linkages more things happening uh, more tangles more knots those are really the interesting things and i think what we're maybe all interested in is th those spaces that are particularly generative like things that are coming out of certain spaces like things that seem to have movement the the lines that have movement um that's interesting not least because those are doings those are actions those are events um but also they they point somewhere and i think there's certainly this idea of um what comes next where does this drive rather than where did this come from 
just such a postmodern, so to speak, uh, crossroads. And precisely because it is such a typical postmodern crossroads that it asks itself why at the end of the unleashing, at the end of the prolifer proliferation of flows and lines and rhizomes is why I think it could be important to track that those styles of jouissance, those ways of flowing and ways of making events back down to the human constant, the human material constant that is perhaps now enabled to an insane extent uh, by the technology and enabled to proliferate in each and every one of us. Uh, but the question, interesting question is to, to, to see, okay, whence does this come from? And what are the tribal dynamics that it, re that it replicates in, in a certain way, even like going back to our nomadological past, you know, pre-civilizational like uh, 200,000 years ago um, and see what kind of development does that represent in that context, right? Which kind of dissolves, it's, it's, post, it's even more postmodern because it kind of dissolves the myth of progress. Because precisely there's no such thing as progress. There's only the, or maybe there is, but like it, it, it forces us to consider, consider it in a huge timeline, a timeline that is not purely technological or even scientific or modern, the way the postmoderns would have us believe, but rather a timeline that has a depth a deep historical material basis that mm, might yield it with a, a different kind of mission with a, a, a deeper kind of foundational power, the power to found a new eon, the power to, again, according to the material anthropological basis, that, that um, by the way, I'm, not, I'm no pro here, you correct me, but based on that basis, you know, what does postmodernism look like if it understands that human beings like to sacrifice and kill each other? If we leave our enlightenment-based post-Christian dogmas behind, what, what, what questions emerge there? Oh my God, it's so scary. No, let's stop being bougies, come on. Everybody dies, the sage will die. But in that death, there will be emergence. And this is a very horrible question that people chastise me always for. But Point being, the conflict, again, okay, Girard. I'm gonna, go, gonna do the Girard thing now, okay? Uh, based on the amount of conflict that is being triggered and unleashed by the unleashing of desire of the last 50 years, especially made apparent on 4chan, the hellhole of the internet, the place where people go to fight and die and kill each other and call each other names. Based on that as a barometer, um, we can we can say that oh shit the the rivalry is emerge is emerging it's growing what happens when there's rivalry well the last two hundred thousand years are clear as water people find a scapegoat they kill it and then there's a Jesus or there's a Zarathustra once in a while who's like hey why don't we just get the other face and like build something nicer fine but like in the digital age um, we we need to rethink this question today once again. Uh, beyond beyond as a flow question as a more postmodern than postmodernism type question as, you know as the flow is all to solve as there's no unifying structure no 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 unifying king and or scapegoat to determine the values to found the phallus that founds the epistemology in the absence of that what kind of Kind of sacrifice do we invent? Do, do, can we see right? Crowley saw this perfectly. Uh, the age of Horus is also an age of, of of that is founded on conflict, on a new way to solve conflict on blood. My, if that's if that's even acceptable to mention. I read on Fortune once a, once a po uh, something that said that. Fortune is a tool of satanic conspiracy, and that it was also a tool of Hegelian, um, and this is a complete tangent of mine, but just to reinforce the idea that it is about raising the temperature of conflict so that the next harvest can come. I think that, that there's a lot that's fucking interesting to riff there. What it puts me in mind of is what our friend Kettle Last is always emphasizing about the difference between Deleuzians and Hegelians. 
namely that in his reading, the Lazians are always seeking to affirm the difference and the radical weirdness and the otherness, but not work through it as negation. Whereas Hegelians are much more focused on the, the negation aspect of the otherness, so the, the obscene excess of it. And that's perhaps where I uh, stand off slightly differently from a, maybe from an anthropology that I see as being slightly Deleuzian in its influence that wants to just kind of track how these things are, are, are moving and the effects that they're having. I think the interesting thing for me is precisely the way in which this becomes a site for perverse enjoyment, precisely the way in which it is excess itself. Like the moment that 4chan becomes socially acceptable, it stops being 4chan. It becomes a place where guardian moms hang out. The moment that porn web becomes socially acceptable, it becomes boring and we find somewhere else to play out our kinks. Like, in fact, it's like two people close to me like have, have often emphasized. My girlfriend, in fact, is a very good reader of, uh, of female psychology. She's like, modern sex is so boring. Why? Because it's so okay. Sex has to feel perverse for it to feel fun. It has to be a sneaky fucking, like a dirty little thing. You have to have some element of transgression or it's just like, okay, we're going to fuck now. Yes. That's why it feels very bizarre walking around in Scandinavia where everyone's beautiful, but like no one, it, it, and it's the people fuck a lot, Dan, you've told me, but it doesn't feel very horny at all. And it, it's similar with, um, with like in a lot of, I've been to, to modern sex clubs and i was like wow there's loads of sex there's loads of naked oh shit this is actually really banal the very attempt to make the space acceptable de libidinalizes it libido needs some kind of blocker some kind of thing in order to really fucking push against and so that's yeah. where my, my interest in like i said in in the 4chan is precisely in it as site of ex obscene excess which means there's going to be ugly stuff coming out of it um but any attempt to kind of resist that or rein that in that oversteps the bounds and turns it into like a guardian mum's cooking section, neutered. And of course, something interesting will pop up in its place. Whether, I mean, okay, fucking an even more bizarre, extreme underground 4chan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can kind of see that um, when child porn was banned on 4chan. <laughs> Although uh, I don't know whether that was when 8chan or 7chan was made, but yeah, that happened. Um, one thing I'm thinking of is um, the uh, the moment that Desaad appears on the scene and sadomasochism is invented. Like it was invented then. It didn't exist beforehand. There was no pleasure in pain. That's wrong completely. That's pain bollocks. is a historical, that's <laughs> historical and relative phenomenon. No, that's completely wrong. You can look at the there history. There was loads of sadomasochism in the ancient world. The whole history of Renaissance art is fucking sadomasochism. We might sadomasochism call it sadomasochism now, but he... Okay, it's not got that name, but the enjoyment of, uh, of domination and submission. Oh, for sure. And that's the whole history of oh, art. Oh, but that's not sado, of which his name is this, you know, like that's not sadomasochism. That's pleasure and pain. So I what think I would you just say, formula. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Tell me your the difference that I would say. So pain is a relative and historical phenomenon in terms of what is painful. Um, we can look at the history of torture and of executions to see. We look back at those people who were going out for the public execution as people's skin was stripped off them and limbs pulled out of sockets. Right. We can look back and we go, God. Life was brutal back then. All those gladiators in the pits as well, you know, getting cut to pieces. People were just more accepting and brutal back then. It tends to be the, the, the view. But rather, um, instead, that there has been a development, a philosophical, whatever, socio socio-psychological development in the understanding of pain um, and observing and witnessing other people's pain and feeling that oneself this sort of like empathic turn which it comes out from this moment of sentimentality in in christianity um so there's people watching those executions before weren't even the people that the ex that were being executed you know 
weren't considering or understanding pain and suffering particularly in the same way as we would now. So Desada rises as, and starts writing specifically against the Christian moment and era of sentimentality and of this, which we see now in Oxfam adverts of seeing somebody else's suffering and pain and feeling bad about that or feeling like there's some moral or ethical instinct to do something about it, or that there should be at the very least, um, that's a particular historical moment. And so Desaad comes out of a moment in the same way as uh, he, that sex and the particular kind of sex and sadomasochism that Desaad was writing about and practicing was this reaction to it was made taboo by sentimentality and so he started to to do that and to write that so it I think it follows on from your point about that sex and pleasure require taboo in order to be that way and that as soon as those spaces become acceptable, that's it's no longer energized to do. The energy for sadomasochism yeah. came from Christian. I, I think well, perhaps in its particular. Yeah, okay, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I There's think you're right. No, 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 There's Daniel. Let me speak. So it's it's about the. I think for me, it's the excess of humanism. So it's the ideals of freedom and utilitarian well-being. That is what modern sadomasochism that starts with the sod is attacking the pleasure of being bound up and experiencing pain it's the antithesis to humanism in that sense not yet not yet the antithesis to humanism the antithesis to enlightenment and to christianity so if there is a uh, the antithesis to humanism is fortune the analogy is the following uh if the sad was emerging from the Christian sentimentality of the Enlightenment, where there had been already some, some, some movements towards democratization uh, and, and, and the like. Um, and then he was the one who took the energy of pleasure pain and gave it the sadistic twist that we came to know and the 20th century was so fascinated with. Uh, and if today it is boring, then that energy has dialectically tra transformed itself once again potentially via 4chan as a vehicle. So if, if postmodernism has relativized sadomasochism, then 4chan has revitalized that post-postmodernism into the transgression of postmodern sentimentality. So they're Foucault in reverse. They're gayer and, and more kinky than Foucault. So if Foucault, you know, am I clear? So if the sentimental postmodernism is what we know as metamodernism or, or, or the hippie variant of that. If the sentimental postmodernism is that typical stance that in 2022 is so common that we must accept all kinds of uh, variations of the one thing, uh, no matter how much fragmented they are and must stretch the center so wide that there is no such thing as a margin. And 4chan tests that assumption to the limit in a, in a, in a, in a in a way that is even more sadistic than sad to invent the new transgression to that. So again, exactly like these, these energies are, you know, there, there would be no Christ without 5,000 years of paganism behind him. Mm. In, in the same way that there would be no fortune if there was no internet and 50 years of postmodernism behind it. Mm. There is always a, a, a charging up of sutric energy and then the tantric attempt yeah. to release it and the dealing with the aftermath of that. The ley lines. So how does this all wrap up in what we see for the future? Because we've been speaking about 4chan, 4chan is Web 2.0. Uh, we've been speaking about the metaverse, we've dropped the name here and there. Patrick, you're you're the digital guy. You're the you're the guy who's got the finger in the pulse in many ways. Where do you see the sites of transgression moving towards? Is it still going to be 4chan in the next five to ten years, or do you see any interesting new cultural places for this sadistic energy to pop up in? Yeah, I mean we're we're entering into a really um, interesting space 
here. And I would say that we're still not done with the last space. Um, 4chan is an image board in the oldest, most web 2.1 sense. Um, and it's still here with us and important and effectual or efficacious, I suppose. And um, but as we're moving into the sort of the embodied understanding of the internet, everything that that brings with bringing the body into these sorts of online spaces, ideas of presence, space, time, all of these perceptions now become involved in a digital space, unlike ever before. Um, and like, and that it really can't be underestimated. Like it, it really can't even just how those feelings um, will affect what we do with technology, what we do in technology, just simply feeling embodied, simply feeling place. Like we could talk forever specifically just about that and, and imagine how that might develop. But I think I, so where there's sites of transgression, we can, we can talk about that. We can think about the body presence, um, especially if it's like porn web, where that's going to go. Um, sex bots, how that's going to work. Huge, hugely important things. But I did, one thing I almost just want to kind of carry into that discussion, if you guys have anything to say about it, one thing I want to carry in is that what is often more dazzling, surprising, and amazing um, than the breakneck pace of technological innovation is the pace of normalization, the pace of the mundane, the, play, the pace of how new technologies arrive and how people immediately make them every day and mundane. Um, and that also means local. That also means, you know, there is no one internet. The internet is a local invention. It is only ever an aggregate of its particular uses in particular places. So we've still yet to live in a truly global internet space. We're talking about 4chan all the time, great. But again, very limited demographic. Um, so what happens when other spaces come online? And also what happens when we move into 3D embodied space? Um, I think the, the amazing and incredible things that are gonna come out of that are going to be how, um, how that is locally understood. Um, how, and those may be spaces that we'll maybe never even see. It's something that I would like to bring into that conversation in terms of, yeah, where transgression and things will be. Mm. I don't know. I like, where would, where would we go? Like we can speculate on it and it'll be a cool porn web where, you know, I don't know. Well, I've got a couple of interesting riffs on that. Like, again, Cadell was talking yesterday at one of his classes on Nietzsche, um, that there was a big uh, gathering, I think, of um, American conservatives recently. It might have been people to associated with the like Jordan Peterson and Daily Wire Club. It might not be. I can't remember. But apparently, what was interesting was that a bunch of uh, a data from the Grinder app was released, and there was a massive spike in Grinder activity. So, in homosexual fucking sexuality, at this spot of. Uh, uh, people going back to conservative family values so that's funny that's kind of interesting and having spent a bunch of time here in the european men's movement where there's a lot of post jordan peterson energy there's a lot of guys want again going back to kind of traditional values and there's a lot of latent homosexuality too it's very interesting so i think that's one of the interesting areas to look for a kind of an obscene homosexual revival in these new conservative communities <laughs> I think something else that's kind of interesting has been um, the popularity of, uh, of Shibari rope bondage in the uh, LGBTQ plus brigade. So the people who are doing the most to untether themselves from any sort of constraints in their social identity are going into spaces where they just get tied up. <laughs> so it, 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 it's, it's whatever social movements are popular look to what the most obscene opposite of it would be. So for example, again, Alexander Bard thinks that among the radical feminist crowd, the next big thing is going to be finding yourself a traditional Muslim husband. <laughs> so it's stuff like that. It's what are the big social movements and what is it the thing, what is the thing that that social movement defines itself against? 
Yeah, okay. So I guess it's like what social movements buying the sex bots. Yes, exactly. Or who is they, the most virulently opposed to the sex bots? <laughs> They'll be the ones who have the sex box in the base in the basement. <laughs> Uh, no, but very- that, it, it speaks to this. <laughs> These are sites of the manifestation of impossibilities that which you just described, Owen. Uh, and it seems like one of the things that we must become a little bit savvy as, as thinkers, I suggest, is the ability to, on one hand of our thought exercise, keep tethered the mental fantasy and then the actuality aspect of things. Whereas, you know, a thinker, think of the activist. The activist is a thinker, a mental aspect, very connected to the active action impulse. Let us take my thoughts and let us make it reality. Let's go and wave signs and do all sorts of activism to make this political thing a reality. Fine. And I'm not, I'm not a Cartesian guy, don't get me wrong, but it's useful to separate mental and philosophical. There are those who want to keep it bound together, but then there are, there's perhaps a, a suggestion that I make is to, to untether those is rather interesting because all of a sudden, if you untether those mental and physical and action aspects of yourself, then you're able to see the mental and the, in, in the manifestations of the mental, uh, some sort of unique color to it that you wouldn't be able to see if it was tethered to action, if it was tethered to reality. The internet has that property. Fortune has that property. The metaverse has that property. Uh, the reason why these these conservative dudes uh, go on grinder is because they precisely go onto this virtual place, my libido, my enjoyment. That's to manifest itself as fantasy on grinder, and then it manifests as action here and there as exception. And as exception, that is the profound side of Jason's. Because if they had if they had no internet, and they've had to take care of their you know homosexual impulses and connect that to their family life. Like it would be a whole different story. But the internet allows the untethering of the mental aspect of jouissance and it allows the jouissance to like sort of go through the mental and then manifest itself somewhere else via new affordances into action once again. Hmm. So again, like, I don't know how this manifests itself, but there's, there's the way to think in which, you know, philosophy and action have to come hand in hand all the time. And we always struggle, 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 struggle. But then there's also the other way in which the actual fantasy as fantasy manifests itself as something that will then influence the reality down the line. Isn't that what Marx or isn't that what I guess so many other thinkers and and people have done throughout history? Wasn't that what Christ did? Wasn't that what what, what Nietzsche did? Yeah. It still does. We come back with this utterly untethered vision that is the unleashing of a form of libido that will then in turn down the line via new affordances, potentially technological, manifest itself into actuality, uh, but could only appear because it has gone through this chrysalis stage of being in the purely in the mental. It's like allowing the desire body to evolve and mature as desire that's body, as very, fantasy, as appearance quality. That's very know? interesting. Because in some way, my head was going back to some of what we were talking about before in terms of stories, uh, myths, conspiracy theories, you know, the construction of the future through through telling of stories. But correct me if I'm wrong, whilst that may be the case, you're also saying that it's almost an auto story um, that the thought has not necessarily been laid down, thought through, told, made into story. But yeah. rather the internet is, again, pulling that line, that string, that thing from you. Um, and it's through this libidinal little Google search. Well, you go, I just download the app. Not maybe I'm going to swipe a couple of times. Maybe I'm just going to have a look, you know? I mean, I'm at, I'm at a conservative conference for the week. I just got to have a look. That yep. maybe it's taking that and that, that it's a story um, that is a story which in some way we're saying is not simply individual, but rather we're seeing this on some sort of group level that some particular, which comes from a philosophy or a political orientation, that there's some collective commonality between that, which produces a collective 
story, um, but it's not one that has been almost um, uh, 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 told, consensually told, or, or co you know, consciously told. But rather, it is out there because of the internet, and I think this would especially be the case of, of in the metaverse um, when considering the way in which people act. Never mind in video games, but it's 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 even more uh, when it comes to the metaverse that people act in very strange and very very untethered ways that we might start to see social phenomena come directly not from the conscious told story but again from the from kind of like a, a subconscious um this untethered thought that you're that you're talking about that we'll start to see those things expressed in internet di digital virtual spaces and then what's important about that because that's interesting in itself but i suppose what's important about it is that that will be a site for creating the future for telling stories about the future and for change might we decartesianize decartesianize this and say that it isn't necessarily that it is the conscious mental that downloads these apps that goes into fortune to enjoy it is not a conscious choice but the autonomous force of unconscious resource in its magnetic omnipotence and the power that exerts over our agency. It is that that goes over the field of available affordances and simply picks the one which will give it, so, give it the best opportunity to unfold. People don't really choose to download Grindr. People don't really choose to go on 4chan or to do these things that we've been discussing. Rather, it is the, the unconscious that is choosing through them. There is a choice being done through the people, uh, despite people's most active resistance to it, as you would expect, for, for example, from these conservative family dudes, right? Gay is anathema. But despite that, you will see a spike there. Mm. Precisely, that's the, that's the thing, right? The porn web is in the shape of shame. It is precisely because you enjoy the shame under the shame there's horniness mm -hmm. there's an unfolding of that unconscious unconscious as unfolding and then that's might we be able to track directionality so this is super interesting and it does tie into what, what we said about 4chan which again if you apply your argument to 4chan that it is some sort of unconscious you know exhibition and, and movement of, of of these thoughts and it has produced political movements and change and um and mm. I, I would heavily suggest that those people were doing it for not for but for the reasons that you describe um that they're not conscious um politically aligned actors that are exhibiting or uh, enacting a plan um that they somehow chosen that i was a bit and it was upstream from that yeah so i i i i'm actually very persuaded by that particular look or interpretation <laughs> of 4chan because i mean i've not really ever found something that i that i thought was persuasive enough and this is not only through experiencing 4chan but experiencing myself as a user of 4chan there's a reason why daniel miller and gabriel coleman won't necessarily come to this conclusion and it's because they won't ever become they won't ever move through that space. They will always be observers, even if they are participant observers. They will never come mm. up through that, you know, particular culture. Um, which again, when we start to get to culture, and if we talk about four channels culture, and we talk about this as those same, those same energies, um, that's very persuasive. So if we understand four channel in that sense, then there's no reason why we can't explain other spaces or spaces to come uh, metaverse spaces or other um wild you know the pale or rather beyond it um that these wild the wild wests those uncharted and and marginal territories there's no reason why those territories are also going you know they're going to continue to exhibit the same political movement and action and wouldn't it be so fascinating if it came from you know, eventually that 
gay conservatism will exhibit itself in some sort of social or political way. And it will do its best to occult itself. What do you mean by that? I mean, the gay conservatism will have to, it will be a dirty secret. It will be something that in the conservative movement, people pretend not to be aligned with. Or they look over and go, oh, there's those gays of, like, you know how some of the guys have gone really gay? We're not like that. But then they go there. It has to operate as a negation of the space. 4chan is fun. I mean, who's the demographic of using 4chan? As, as, who's the demographic of 4chan? As far as I understand, it's, like you said, it, it's young men, but especially young men who feel slightly disempowered. It's not like high-flying bankers oh, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. or rock stars who yeah. actually live high adrenaline sex. Yeah, they, they went to Reddit. Lifestyles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, it's a place. It's a place to get sex, drugs, and rock and roll for people who don't live out the sex, drugs, and rock and roll fantasies that they want. Yeah. Same with porn web. It's a way of having the fucking sex, drugs, and rock and roll sex life that you don't have in your real life. Yeah, it's, so, it's, it's Peterson's target audience to some or a large section of it is. And again, I don't say that lightly because I take 4chan very seriously. Absolutely. And Peterson's not the answer. The Peterson, it, Peterson is ultimately trying, it, it, it's, a first, <laughs> it's a first order answer. He's trying to impose what I guess in our circles we refer to as like sutric morality. So trying to be like, put some restrictions around yourself so then you can actually do stuff of meaning. But the issue is, the perverse enjoyment is still there and will leak out whenever it needs to. Oh, yeah. Like, you won't find... And that probably is the gay conservatives. <laughs> That's all these guys who were pre-Pope Petersonian. They were nihilistic, lost, blah, blah, blah. So now they've put themselves into the Petersonian straitjacket and it is now returning as a, a, what would be the most, uh, the perverse thing I could do here to go and fuck another guy. Does that mean that LGBTQ plus will always be left wing? I know, that's a statement. I no. I, it, to, to, I the extent, to the extent that it remains the issue. Well, here's the paradox. At the moment, LGBTQ plus has become a conservative thing because they've established clear categories that everybody has to defend. And that's why it's neutered itself. The LGBTQ plus movement will become creative and sexy again when it gets over its desire to be recognized at every level of institutional power. As center. Yeah. It's not fun. It's not sexy. The only sexy LGBTQ thing anymore is RuPaul. And that's because it remains phallic men dressing up as women. It's, yeah, it's so interesting. No one wants to, pride is fucking lame, but RuPaul, yeah. RuPaul is glamour. RuPaul's cutthroat. That's the thing. Where all of the other movements, oh, acceptance, inclusion. RuPaul's fucking cutthroat. You ain't good enough. You fucking walk off. <laughs> it's 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 super interesting because I suppose the, the community has been having issues with, well, what is your gay and your right wing um, that no longer... In certain areas of the world, does your life experience lead you to a particular kind of politics? Like, what do we do about gay conservatives? Like, <laughs> through with Trump in a big way, just like, what do we do with these people that don't share our values? Especially when you're thinking Zoomers as well, like all these kids coming through and all the coming out stories are, are totally fine. And, and now those kids are trying to exile kink from pride you know, what does that say uh, about a, a kind of a conservative movement? Zoomer conservative, conservatism is gay. That's what it says. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Zoomer conservatism scary. is gay. That's so, that's so interesting. Like, I find, like, I mean, this is, like, it's a fun and, like, odd thought to think through. Um, this kind of thing. Um, I, I, I feel though, you know, I feel like we've, it, like in the stratosphere, like I feel again, very far away from some sort of grounding earthy material mm. understanding of what this all is. 
Um, and I, I kind of lose my wick, especially now that I've been working on metaverse things, I lose my wick a bit when thinking too much about the future um, and thinking too much in those sorts of terms because it's, it might never happen, mate. Like I get almost frustrated by, um, I want to know what I can do now. I, I, I would venture say that we need a theory of creativity that includes that, that frustration as the fuel, or rather precisely the ways in which it is not going to happen. Those are the interesting things. Uh, precisely the ways in which it, it is going to flop heavily. What are the, what does that teach us? Because it seems like there's some specific ways in which people deeply, really almost desperately desire the future to go and to happen. People really desire certain things for the future, uh, desperately. And in the failure of those intentions, that will show something else uh, is, is the heuristics I would suggest here. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I like that. The inter, you know? I'm really convinced by something in what you guys have been saying. In particular, this that I, that I guess kind of revolves around this gay conservatism or this whatever this thing is. <laughs> um, there's something really, really attractive about that. <laughs> Not you know specifically gay conservatism, though no, I'd have a go. But, but <laughs> so not specifically gay conservatism, but rather the the oppositional thing, or rather what is orbiting around that. That's just the one phrase that's kind of like that that's kind of sitting at the, a little bit at the center of it. But gay um, Republicans for Trump. You have to think of the phenomenon plus its obscene kind of opposite as one thing. So yeah. like guardian mums who want to defend the rights of conservative Muslims. I, I just I, I mean I, I love this and I, I think I think I know maybe I know why I, I love it because maybe that is so uh, in my mind is one particular there's this narrowing there's this, always this narrowing of the future again talking about utopianism talking about stories of the future um, there's always this sort of narrowing cone like um, view um, of the future in particular, when you look at whether it's, you know, yeah, social trends, certainly in a surface element, you can go, well, it's been going like this, therefore it's probably going to continue that way, which is also this myth of modernity and this whole teleological view of progress and, and, and the like. And I can know that's wrong, but at the same time for me, one of the, I suppose, one of the big questions in my mind, I don't know the question, but I know it was represented by will LGBTQ plus always be left wing? The, you've provided an answer to that. You provided an answer which for me also satisfies a understanding of the world, which is, is like Fortran, constantly proliferating, constantly um, uh, finding inversions of itself and, and almost in, in, a, in a way that would have just seemed chaotic, which, Teleology and modernity and stuff sort of seeks to resolve. Um, it, it you provided a, a good reason for why LGBTQ plus could and might always remain left wing or always remain conservative. That it will rather remain in one particular camp, or it, it, it will it, it 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 won't be everybody's future, but that rather new expressions of sexuality plus politics might arise. Um, I, and I know I'm not necessarily making sense there, but what I can hear, what I can kind of see through some of what you're saying is that, that a concept of continuing proliferation, a, a reason or a description of the engine which will continue to make the future multiplus and confusing and full of strange, weird opportunities Yes. The litmus test for this is to post this on 4chan and see how people react. Honestly, right? Post this on poll. 
gay conservatives for Trump. And how well, this, this, yeah, I mean, this is where we should go back. This is where we should go back. We should, we should, we should pull out the notepads. And this is why we should do anthropology of 4chan, because we might be speculating about here, but the people actually doing it there, there's a huge romance, last time I checked, between Paul and the LGBT board. Huge confluence. Every time there's a 4chan ball, I don't know if they do those anymore. Um, it's almost like a kind of fictional, weird kind of role play that they do. It's very strange. You never really see much like that uh, on 4chan, but typically every year there would be a ball, different boards would go across to other boards, cross pollinate and invite them to go to the ball yeah. together. X and B were like a popular pairing. But Paul and LGBT have this like Sundere relationship of like mutual love and mutual hate. Or just post it on the porn ones. I got tits. That might be hmm? I got tits. Fantastic. So politics is downstream from culture. Culture is downstream from 4chan. And 4chan is downstream from gay shit is the conclusion that I take from this conversation. One more time. <laughs> That can't be all we talked about. <laughs> oh, baby, you can come back and we can do this again. I would love to. I would love to. Um, I would love to meet as well. I would love to also um, have a uh, um, read some of the things that you like. I, there's 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 some things that I, that I think. I need to really like unblock a flow between some of the stuff that I, in particular, I, I suppose some of the like the religious things, like um, spiritual stuff. Maybe I just, Daniel's just going to tell me I need to read Gerard. But I'd like some stuff that like you guys think is, is, is key or like particular to your lines of inquiry or thinking. You should follow Cattle Lost on YouTube. <laughs> One of our close friends, Hegelian, Lacanian, psychoanalytical philosopher. But I think he's really fucking holding the ground for a lot and teaching this way of I get with dialectical thinking. So always thinking about the neg negativity of a movement as integral to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Negative. which is kind of becoming popular again with guys like Zizek kind of living the charge, but against the much more popular Deleuzean way of thinking, which, as I said, is much more kind of just a f affirmation of difference. Yeah, yeah. Without yeah. looking at the tensions and the contradictions within the difference. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I really want to do that because there's also a big stream in, in anthropological thinking around, um, typically it was about sim uh, similarity, but um it came through the ontological turn in anthropology with this this thinking about difference multiple ontological real well, multiple ontologies um and the like and there's, some, there's a bunch of stuff there that i would really like to to talk about and i would really like to have some more of that like anthropology speak like if i enter into a space like this uh, and been watching some of the stuff that you guys have done been talking to daniel and things like there's i have so much to give um i would like to enter some of that stuff into this conversation and see how it plays, see what it does. It's a little bit of prep. Let's get some five, 10 ideas each to bring to the, to the V2 of this. Yeah, and I think the first place- I is think there's a lot of- You reading some stuff. I like what you brought yeah, up about Dasad. I think like starting thinking about that would be great. Yeah. Because I, I've been looking for an excuse for a long time to go back into that. It's just why I was probing Daniel for like, well, what are we going to talk about? Like, what could I, you know, because I want to have some, something more than, than, than some of the light service anecdotes, which really serve, if you're talking like, certainly with anthropology, they normally, they, they carry me a long way going, oh, well, these people do this. Where's your universality now? but plumbing a little bit more into some of those depths. And um, I would like to go back to some of that stuff, um, scoop that out, especially decide I've been looking for a reason to do that for, for a good while. 
Assad was the Saz ghost is 4chan. The Saad was 4chan of his day, locked up inside of a fucking dungeon writing yeah. his perverse yeah. books. How about uh, how about Crawley's porn? Yeah, and shit like that. I would love a good reason to get into fucking more because that's some bonker okay. shit. Oh, we're deep Even in Crowley 4chan, at the moment. Oh, sick. Even 4chan isn't as, isn't as uh, disgusting as Crowley's porn. That's saying something. Wow. Um, I've not read his, his porn. Would <laughs> like to. It would be my pleasure. Um, I would, yeah, and I would love to get his pleasure. Place. Because that's something for me as well. Like, um, very interested in that, Owen, as well. Uh, you know, like... Um, some of the occultism and things it's something again that i've been touching the corners of for a, a good long while now which is it's but it, it's something still outside of my wheelhouse but very interested in it um and i can so sort of throw some readings back and forth as well like the occult anarchism stuff something i'm very interested in mm. as a material anthropologist because a lot of occultism and its big recent trend i see as a re-enchantment of materials and or at least materiality is a way of getting back to a form of spiritualism and spirituality or even a way of something that anthropologists have wanted to do for a long time is is to fully go native is to believe the thing that the natives believe to believe this weird story about a snake god and a this that and the other um but have never because of a modern condition never being able to quite access but i believe that materials maybe ontological philosophy either is a way back to that re-enchantment of the world or at least represents a desire to do that. <laughs> yeah, this is this is mind-blowing. I love this this last desire thing that you mentioned. This anthropological will to go and believe that the gods are gods and the snakes are there. Wow. Wow. And I, I think it might I be... I vibe true. with that. I vibe with that a lot. Because I see the way for. It's not going back to that. It's going forward to that. Yeah. Is my vibe here. And you could even carry that across into own oh, your point about shibari bondage you know maybe it's materiality rather than symbolism you know um latex leather why and when do they arrive you know and if it's you know and also what is it next silicon with the the sex doll you know like do we, well we want to see the wires um not the strings but the wires like whose blood well, yeah, the object, there's, there's something material here and there's a material element of the spirituality that is often missing and I think might be missing. I, 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 I want to be the guy who says, let's bring Gerard into this as well. Let's, because uh, if you speak about material element of spirituality, you can go around him and the fact that the element, the material element of spirituality is blood as the resolution of conflict. Okay. And it seems like... Yeah, so maybe there's something... Maybe there's something here because I'm already starting to feel a little bit more safe or a little bit more grounded. I think there's something interesting in like, I guess a, a thesis popped into my head that spirituality is the fetishism of the material. So whenever there's a particular material that exerts a particular force upon the libido that isn't properly understood, there will spirit and deity be found. Case zero, the dead scapegoat who becomes exactly, the guy. Exactly. So the dead scapegoat, or blood, or wine, or latex, or leather, or fortune, or Adolf. Yeah. Or Adolf. Exactly. Kind of a material experience. Yes, it is. It's it's material that exerts a perverse effect upon our libido. Is deified as a way to fucking make sense of it. So. This idea of spirituality being in another plane, wrong. There's no depth beyond the surface. It's rather the sense of there's a, there's a particular surface that exerts a particular magnetic pull upon it. And so the fantasy is that there's something beneath that surface called God. But we have to turn it around and look into what part of me is being turned on by the surface. How am I fetishizing material? There do I find God. And whenever a collective way of fetishizing the material becomes so attractive because we mimic this shit from each other, so as to gain momentum and build up almost a libidinal insurrection collectively, it, it either becomes a dominant thing or it gets defeated in a big war. But at the end of the day, 
it exerts the pull of, of, an, of a world order, i.e. money. It's just paper. In God we, we trust. To believe in. That is God. And so the true meaning of anarchy or insurrection is precisely the foundation of new modes of liberal and enjoyment, but which must account for the truth of sacrifice the true material basis of fetishization and spirituality. In other words, the question is whose blood goes into the sex doll? So that its enjoyment can be truthful enough to found a new era. All right. It's like we've covered a lot of ground. I think so. Um, anything else to say on, on fetish? I just, I'm wondering about, the, like, I think the sex doll is like a blank canvas. The, I think the sex doll is not the thing to look at. It's what, what inscription upon the sex doll, what symbols doll will be interest. most interesting. So it's, it's not like sex doll is sex doll. It's like the Michaela Peterson sex doll. That'll be big. Kayla Peterson is her father, her sex doll. Exactly, the Jordan Peterson it. sex doll. It'll be stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Never mind deep fakes. What was it? I think it was you that was saying like, if you're a, if you're a celebrity now, you're a celebrity forever. Yeah. Yeah. Like, forever as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mariah Carey will never get out of the of the of the Christmas era like she will forever be remembered and her face will always be plastered on to things even even if she's 90 because just they'll just deep fake her well even more weird right? just, the internet there's no incentive to, wipe. to get a new character there everything is going to be recorded forever all of these youtube videos we do are going to be there unless the data bank is wiped there for the ais of the future to search and bring out our faces bring out the words that we're saying to do natural language processing of every techno social episode in the split of a second and then bring it up so it's like we're already creating fucking avatars of ourselves that will fucking merge with the data god of the future fucked such that the the ethical thing then to do rather than the fulfillment of one's own pursuit of the cookie so to speak in other words the pursuit of self-satisfaction through content, which would lead the route of casinification once the AI takes care of everything. Basically, the AI knows everything about us. They know that we're addicted to immediate self-debasing uh, pleasures. Therefore, they will casin casinify reality so as to monetize us. Then the ethical thing to do is the, to do the opposite, right? To renounce those base enjoyments as a choice, as a tantric choice of authority, of self, of self authorship, uh, so as to create potential new avenues for creativity. And that's why the ground zero of authority is to say, I shall not come. And I shall do that as a tantric spiritual practice that allows me to be creative in a way that uh, has a little bit more agency, more creativity. And once the AI just takes over, I will still be human. This was a stretch. Well, this is when I think I said it to you once before, Daniel. It's like this is when I really like to imagine um, the the failure of the future to arrive, like because this is still the narrative which takes place under a certain set of conditions. Yeah. Which, you know, we're we're again extrapolating. This it does. Of, it's a grift. It's a grift. It is. And uh, maybe that's why like the apocalypse does have such an law as one of the defining and largest myths um, and visions of the future. Like maybe that's why it has such um, or rather it would be interesting to look into why it has such a, a defining feature. And I wouldn't say that's just because, you know, the Frank James quote, which is about the, that Mark Fisher uses like um you know, it's easier to imagine the end of capitalism than the, or the end of the world than it is the end of capitalism. I don't know if it's simply about a, a, a sort of, I don't think it's just an economic or material lamentation. You know, lots of stuff does get destroyed, but it's, yeah, like maybe, 
or maybe it's it's gaining ground as a vision because of this sort of like social catastrophe that we're we're imagining will somehow and someday arrive this ai narrative this metaverse and that narrative this 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 idea that we're going to be digital or last forever it's like wow wow i don't know i I even flip it on its head. I think the really horrific thing is the like the people who will think the world's going to end because of the environmental crisis. It's like, no, it isn't. We might. There's a, no, I mean, I, I think, I think the whole fetishism of the environmental crisis is just a way of avoiding the fact that we're terrified that we actually are going to live on into the 22nd century. <laughs> Yeah, this is actually that's a kind of what I was stabbing at, but yeah, oh, wow, guys, at. this is genius, right? This is genius. So the the, the, the horrific thing, thing is that we stay alive. <laughs> yeah, it's suicidal. The desire is for us to die. But more than that, <laughs> that's what people want. That's what people want. They don't want to keep going. They don't want to see how this plays out. They already have unlimited internet porn. They already have 4chan. They're like, I want to get off this fucking thing. Yeah. Please. Yeah, yeah fucking environment come and crush us and this is that's what, what these people are fantasizing about. And, 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 how, and, and, and and more than that right it's the what happens once these fantasies that are so structural negatively to the to the social reality that we live in right now the fantasies of ai of, of, of bitcoin of the environmental catastrophe of all these things right they may well prove to be true but what happens once we realize that the future fails to arrive. Fuck, that's a huge question, right? Because it, the cultural order, even deeper than the world order, financial order, is founded precisely on these myths of negative future. They're the moral order of the day. Morality today is equivalent to a series of value and epistemological statements that are negatively based, based on the devil that is in the front. All these horrible myths of, my God, behave, otherwise the big bag hell will arrive or the devil in the past dr h so at the end of the day we're negatively framed by that but what happens when that future fails to arrive what happens to well like our culture is gonna ha is gonna crash morally this is, this morally. is what ha it has been happening right like the, the 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 this is um you know derrida's hauntology right and there's a specter of or is it there's a spectre haunting Europe and it's, it's the spectre of communism. Um, he talks about the, the concept that one can be haunted, not simply as a ghost would from the past, but also from the future. Um, that these narratives and myths of progress, of certainly of, of modernity, um, they, when they fail, you know, they haunt us, whether they're going to arrive or not, they, they haunt us. Wow. So, you know, we never got our hoverboards, guys. Um, and the fantasy is not of Jouissance past, but of Jouissance to come. And in past, Sorry, it's, kind of the same. Um, it's, it's both made of, of stories and myths. And yeah, this, this, this promised future has repeatedly failed to arrive. Um, it finds its way into. Um, music literature as well to describe a sort of like the, the post-punk era which you know is where we can certainly see the seeds of our you know modern condition the war becomes a possibility once again and and thatcher and and cold war and all that sort of stuff um but yeah and it also would explain some of the uh, elements of like nostalgia within within modern culture um but it's a really interesting thought to think that Wow. the failures of things that we've been promised are now they are important because they're affecting what we do in this moment and thinking of the apocalypse like i mean in because there's a few things we said there and in what way and where does that apocalyptic narrative maybe it takes place in many of those fronts but where exactly does it slot in is it a future that's failed to arrive and therefore we're being haunted by it now. I, I think it's, a suicidal it, it's the flip side of progress. So here's my theory that just came into my head. The end of traditionalism, the death of God, is not the freeing of human potential for a better world, but rather simply the liberating of things like libido and capital and information that point towards a world that is so radically alien 
and unknowable that it's terrifying. Thus, the myth of progress arrives as a compensation fantasy that it's going to be better. It's going to be nicer. As we get to a point where the myth of progress seems to be crumbling in on itself, it's no longer viable. The inverse of that is that it's the end of the world. But the negation of the negation is that it's neither. We are facing neither progress into a better world nor the apocalypse into the fucking end but rather a fucking blind stumbling into the world of all sorts of fucking... Yeah, this is the proliferation that you were kind of making me see or imagine, or at least this is the... Because you're breaking through some of this. That's, that is my cone vision. And this idea of proliferating things, it feels oddly refreshing in the face of those other totalizing or... So, so we come to worship... Not, what we worship today is not money or unleashed libido or progress or science, but precisely their failure to deliver a transcendental myth. We worship that failure as failure. And that's the, the end of the, the world future. that structures. It's a non-God. It's a failure. It's the future that doesn't come, that doesn't arrive. Daddy's not coming. And I, what I like about this is when, when uh, Donna Haraway talks about um, what she, she has tried or, you know, she doesn't like the Anthropocene because it's, it's you know, too cent it's centering the human too much. She calls it the Cthulhu scene, um, not Cthulhu like the Lovecraftian god, but rather the, um, and I'm maybe butchering this a little bit, but um, it comes from a Greek understanding of a power or a force beyond the gods. Um, the gods, um, whatever, Daphne, Zeus, whoever, they're <coughs> running around doing their thing. They're obviously acting within the world, famously, those Greek gods are always up to shit. But there was this idea that there was some sort of force beyond, underneath, and it was horrific and tentacular. And moralless and ethic without ethics without you know i suppose pure pure chaos in a way um and it was that force this almost like true god god beyond gods that um sort of you know licked at the outskirts of the world um and the cthulhu scene in this sense is the understanding that the the world will be fine this is not gaia again this is not some sort of divine Mommy. feminine as, as close to nature view of the world, which maybe is that Celtic occult, whatever, maybe that's how we, we pitch it. But I just really, I'm just charmed by this Greek vision of, of uh, the world will be fine. The world will just devour, destroy uh, and eat us. That what we're worried about is our own mortality. And that's what we're confronting. The world will be fine, but this, God beyond God um, is what will gobble us all up. I got this idea from Crowley the other day. In fact, Crowley was quoting someone else. No, maybe it was Dion Fortune quoting someone, quoting some unnamed, um, intensely powerful adept. He simply said, God is pressure. And I've been thinking about that a lot. This idea that but behind all the symbols and the pantheons and the gods, there is simply differential pressure. And that is the engine of time, of movement, of history, buildups of pressure. Wow. Back to geology. Yeah. Whoa. What did you say? Psychogeology. Back to geology. Right. Yeah. Fuck. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You do what he does. <laughs> oh, we, 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 we spend enough time together, you end up acting like your dog, right? <laughs> you, God. Spell, that, spell that backwards. I really like that. Like I've really like I've 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 tried out and, and talked and, and run around sort of like this. Mm, what about the apocalypse? What about ontology? What about um Haraway? But like that's the most I've ever had back from that kind of conversation 
that's it seems to have been taken a step further in my opinion you have done that but collectively neurological geology it can only be heuristics can't the pressures it? beneath like it. it the ideologies the philosophies the religions the identities their tectonic plates on the surface of being and pressures exist beneath them the pressure of the real the pressure of violence and sex and death which forces the plates to rub up against each other and there's volcanic sites like 4chan like porn which cannot be mapped which cannot be mapped in any tenable scientific way other than but rather must be mapped almost via the antenna of your libido or your actual antenna proper like well i, I would, I would it's, even go it's back then, it's, well, well i would i would say there also so i mean something that that might a metaphor that i would like use here or, or try to give you daniel in maybe describing mm. that is the the hot spot um, it's a formation where there happens to be a particular magma plume. Uh, and as a plate moves across this particular plume, um, it, it stays static, but the plate moves across it. And you get island chains, you get archipelagos from this, you get Hawaii from this. So there's a consistent, there's a constant, and it's an underlying drive, maybe, and that it exhibits you know it produces an island maybe it's particularly active one year maybe the place is quite static produces a big island moves smaller smaller yeah does that fit into the completely but it's more like the, the metaphor makes sense but the, the 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 metaphor that describes the praxis of navigating this for us as digital anthropologists or, or, or folks who spend too much time online uh, is one that you know I sense that such an investigation is so subjective that it's very hard to map and can only be mapped via intuition and even uh, unconscious intuition by almost a magical act. I feel like magic, especially the more perceptional type of magic that is able to grasp resources for its own operations from anything and everything. And that's that's a that's that's a smarter way to go about mapping the neurological geology than um, the more traditional anthropo anthropological things, right? At least while you're in the thick of it. In 50 years, maybe you can map it better because it's more static. You can hindsight gives you that advantage. But right now, it feels like the best thing is the heuristics, obviously, and that heuristics can be characterized by sort of an ongoing research praxis and antenna that includes yourself as part of that, that research and that includes yourself as you know just look at 4chan as the ever volatile ground zero for a specific flare-up of that type what we see there is the is a snapshot of the libido and the of the web over the last 10 minutes and right now that volcano can be a little bit calmer. It's mm. Maybe, in, you know, once the elections come, it will become less calm. And yet it is a flare up of all of these things combined, you know, sex and politics of power and, and play and fun and trickster energy and all of those energies put together in this fucked up cauldron, right? Ever in flow is my point. Yeah. Which, the, which doesn't mean that, so in other words, it's not like the territory has, it's not like the gods are spread out topologically in a traditional way throughout the territory. Rather, they're all superimposed upon each other over the same, same lens through which we see reality. And so the only distinction we can make of, of gods is more like a perceptional choice rather than a topological essence. The gods are the, are the, pentagrams you draw on top of the lens you put on top of your, of your eyes when you look at reality. If you draw another shape, you put different glyphs, you will see different gods. It's a property of the perceiver, not of the perceived. Yeah. That's why you yourself are the great vessel for, 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 for these energies as perceiver. That's why magic is so tricky because it, it always like, you are the one included in it. You are the means for its fulfillment, for its advancement that's why there's such a thing as the talent of the magician 
Yeah, and I, I think one of our our weaknesses, or maybe maybe something that that the ontological turn in anthropology might might teach us, is that we we don't take those cosmologies or those those different lenses, <coughs> take them seriously. Um, that the ontological turn that has been, I mean, David Graeber did like I just a just a vicious takedown of the kind of entire movement um, by just going, it's apolitical and then walking away. But there's this, um, I think it's by Holbrad, um, uh, an essay, which kind of exemplifies maybe what I'm trying to get at, which is called the power, I think it's the, the powder is powerful, something like this, where essentially what they were trying to do is trying to get at that, those different lenses, but, but take them seriously. In the sense mm -hmm. that an anthropologist might normally walk up to this I think it was Cuban witch doctors and they they had this powder that was magic and was used in rituals and it was made of spit and ash and whatever else, salt and you know, magical substances. The anthropologist would look at that as symbols, would pull that apart. Why do these people think this is magical? You know, magic is about efficaciousness, so let's look at the effects of it, all that sort mm -hmm. of stuff. But but the ontological anthropologists went. Well, why don't we just start our analysis from the point of accepting that the powder is powerful? Just accepting that and taking that cosmology seriously. And now you can start to see where I was talking about the material anthropologist or a re-engagement with the material as either a route to spiritual belief, faith, whatever, um, or whether it just represents a desire to get close to that. But they started and just went, the powder is powerful and treated it as the practitioners and their participants would treat it as magical. And that unlocks this whole host of different ways of looking at stuff. Suddenly your analysis can, can move to different places and certainly more spiritual dimensions simply through doing that. Wow. It's just that the metaverse doesn't have any fetish there yet. It is a fetish to be itself. It's a fetish itself. Yeah. What is the fetish of the metaverse? What does that signify? It's like the, it's like the jar full of spit and ash and salt itself. You choose to believe it and therefore... Well, I, I, you can look at different fantasies of... And I think we should wrap up in a sec. I'm getting really yeah. hungry. And I say this as I'm starting a new idea, but uh, fuck it at least what I get from like the kind of mainstream corporate fantasies around the metaverse is it's like a nice playground. There's something very childish about it. It's like a place where everything is going to be nice and we can do loads of cool things. It's like this notion that it's going to be an adventure playground. Well, what can we do for the metaverse? How are we going to go to the metaverse? And it's the same it's like, what can we do for the village fair? What, what are we going to do? Like what's our <laughs> primary school going to do for the village fair? <laughs> It's so true. And it's such a terrifying, isn't it such a fun, it will be a very funny way to start off something that is going to be quite, quite mad in, in the end. It's going to be pure. Or just pure. boring. Or just boring. Or just, yeah, That's very, very place. mundane. Yeah, yeah. And completely colonized as a, as a, as a space. As an ad space. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny. Like the, the village fair, I think this, there's a reason why Bezos wanted to go to space because as a kid, he had those little glowy stars, probably, you know, stuck to his ceiling. Um, there's a reason why Zuckerberg wow. wanted to build a metaverse is because he played Ocarina of Time <laughs> as a child instead. Um, and that's why we have this. Like, that's the only reason why. Um, and it's the only way that he can conceive of this particular thing. No clue about what they're actually building. Um, but it seems like they're quite committed to an idea of, a, of an open metaverse. And even if they're not, they're simply going to build the technology upon which we can tinker with. Forgive them, Father, for they know what or not what they do. <laughs> and precisely in the failure of the arrival of the metaverse, we will find the vitality for some new fun stuff. Because once the future doesn't arrive in, the, in yeah. those ruins. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a wonderful another thought experiment to, to, to imagine a, a metaverse where the future has essentially just died. Um, 
how how fascinating that would be like it would just be this sort of weird island in um a particular technological development where it just this this a, a dead end of vaporwave it's vaporwave yeah 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 that would be fascinating yeah that would be cool want such a beautiful and uncanny idea yeah right shall Let's we wrap off my dudes After this was an hours. absolute pleasure patrick no come thank back you soon. so much i was, I was certainly again. certainly nervous um and yeah especially doing it over like having like a first meeting over a video and stuff but we very very much love to in some way maybe it maybe it's london maybe london's the spot let's go to glastonbury man yeah we'll sit on glastonbury tour yeah i would be i would be mad up for that or uh, we can go visit the london stone what's that you got a, a fun google ahead of you let was let can, is there a place or a way that we can share readings and stuff that you can s- throw something stuff at me whatever let's, let's open up a chat Let's open yeah, up yeah. A chat. let's do a chat. I'd room. like to really also throw stuff in, but the London Stone, look into Owen. You're into the ley lines in London. I will. Let me Google that. Fascinating Ooh. history. One of those very, very unknown walked past trodden on um, London artifacts that is full of story. A lump of rock that is full of, full of stories. It's a perfect example of some of the shit we've been talking about. Right. All right, dudes. Thank you for this time. Drop, drop your number on the teams, please, Patrick. And thank you so much for yeah. for for doing this. Yeah, I'll put it on the teams, right? And okay. Thank you, guys. What a pleasure. Have a good night. You too. Bye.